As far as I remember, I had every single item in the catalog in hand at least once. And on this occasion I became aware of the enormous influence which the Mongol invasions and the events of the 15th century, especially the temporary victory of Tamerlane over Bayezid, had as a model of political structure in the 16th century. Practically every author of importance dealt with these events which were completely outside the normal structure of politics within a community and introduced an inexplicable rise to power as a factor into world history which affected the very existence of Western civilization. This experience of the Ottoman threat and its temporary interruptions through the victories of Timur were observed by the humanists and entered into the conception of the man who can rise to power by his own qualities of energy into Machiavelli's prince. Some of the voluminous materials gathered at the time I published in an article on Das Timur Bild der Humanisten, I believe 1937, which I later had reprinted in my anamnesis of when was it, 1966. The influence of these events on Machiavelli, and especially in his fictitious biography of Castruccio Castracani, I published in my article on Machiavelli's background in the review of politics. But considerable piles of material and the connection with the work of Baudin have never been published. In the same year 1934, I spent some weeks in London exploring the resources of the Warburg Institute, which had already moved there from Hamburg. This was my first contact with the alchemy, astrology, and complicated Gnostic symbolism of the Renaissance. The materials collected on this occasion were incorporated in a chapter on astrological politics from a history of political ideas, which however has not been published. This first acquaintance was the basis for my further interest in astrology and alchemy, which developed much later and helped me to gain some understanding of certain continuities in Western intellectual history from the Middle Ages through the Renaissance into the present. Concerning Oxford in 1921 or 2, I was lucky enough at this time to get through personal connections a fellowship for a summer school in Oxford. The official purpose of the fellowship was to learn English and I remember an excellent young Englishman who did his best to correct my mispronunciations. The great impression at the time, however, was Gilbert Murray. The impression must be explained in terms of my complete ignorance, of course, of the English context of science and philosophy. And it was a first introduction to distinguished English scholars. The comparatively primitive level on which my receptiveness was yet at the time may be gathered from an experience one evening when I strolled around Oxford and on some suitable square found a public speaker who harangued a spare's audience. I understood him to advertise some kind of cheese and it took me some time to find out that he was rather propagating Jesus. Concerning my dissertation, its subject matter was Wechselwirkung und Gezweihung. Wechselwirkung was the favorite term of Georg Sibyl in his sociology, which forms the basis for the further development of the Beziehungslehre in German sociology. Gezweihung was the favorite term in the sociology of Ottmar Spann. The difference was the ontological one of constructing social reality out of relations between individuals and the assumption of the pre-existent bond of a spiritual nature between human beings that would be realized through their personal relations. It was an opposition between an individualistic and in Spann's term 
universalistic construction of society. The dissertation was never published, and I'm afraid I hardly remember now the details. During the year in Colombia, when I took the courses of Giddings and Dewey and read their work, I became aware of the categories of social substance in the English-speaking world. John Dewey's category was like-mindedness. And I found out that the word like-mindedness was the term used by the King James Version to translate the New Testament homonoia. That was the first time I became aware of the problem of homonoia, about which I knew extremely little at the time, because my knowledge of classic philosophy was still quite defective, and my knowledge of Christian problems practically non-existent. Only later, when I had learned Greek and was able to read the text in the original, did I become aware of the fundamental function of such categories for determining what the substance of society really is. The term of Giddings was the consciousness of kind. So I did not know very much about the background of these problems. I remember already becoming aware that Giddings was intending the same problem as John Dewey, but preferred a terminology that would not make visible the connection of the problem with classic and Christian traditions. It was an attempt to transfer the harmonia in the sense of the community of the spirit into something more innocuous, like a community of kind in a biological sense. As anecdotes just related show, there is a frequent misunderstanding of my personal attitude in politics, and especially with regard to National Socialism, because entirely too many people who express themselves in public cannot understand that there could be reasons to be anti-National Socialist, other than partisan motivations of a political type. My reasons for having hated National Socialism from the time that I got first acquainted with it in the 1920s can be reduced to very elementary reactions. There was in the first place the influence of Max Weber. One of the virtues which he demanded of a scholar was intellectuelle Rechtschaffenheit which can be translated as intellectual honesty. I cannot see any reason why anybody should go into the social and generally human sciences unless he wants honestly to explore the structure of reality. Ideologies, whether positivistic or communistic, or Marxist or national socialist, indulge in constructions which are intellectually not tenable. That raises the question why people who otherwise are not quite stupid and have the secondary virtues of being quite honest in their daily affairs would indulge in intellectual dishonesty on a major scale. That it is a case of intellectual dishonesty is beyond a doubt because the various ideologies after all have been submitted to criticism and anybody who is willing to read the literature knows that and why they are not tenable. If one adheres to them, nevertheless, the prima facie case is that of intellectual dishonesty. And behind that overt intellectual dishonesty arises then the question why a man would indulge in it. That is a general problem which required in my later years of studies very complicated research to ascertain the nature causes and persistence of states of alienation, but more immediately, on the immediately accessible overt level, brought me of course in opposition to any ideologies, Marxist, Fascist, National Socialist, what you will, because they were incompatible with science in the rational sense. I again refer back to Max Weber as the great influence which brought that problem to my attention. And I still today maintain that anybody who is an ideologist cannot be a competent social scientist. The partisan problems 
as a consequence, are of secondary importance because they come then under the category of various ideologists battling each other, and that is not an entirely new phenomenon. I observed the same problem in my studies of the Reformation intellectual battles in the 16th century, where I summarized the problem in the formula that you have a situation where everybody is so wrong that you have just to maintain the opposite in order to be at least partially right. That is important for understanding the intellectual structure of what is called the public, but it certainly has nothing to do with science. As a consequence, I have been called every conceivable name by partisans of this or that attitude. I have in my files the documents according to which I am a communist, a fascist, a national socialist, an old liberal, a new liberal, a Jew, a Catholic, a Protestant, a Platonist, a Neo-Augustinian, a Thomist, and so forth. And of course I have been an Hegelian. Not to forget that I was strongly influenced by Yui Long. This list I consider of some importance because the various characterizations are of course always the pet bait noir of the respective critic and give therefore a very good picture of the intellectual destruction and corruption which characterizes the contemporary academic world. Understandably, I have never answered to criticisms of this kind because the critics of this type are objects of inquiry but not partners in a discussion. A further motive of my hatred of National Socialism and other ideologies is a quite primitive one. I have an aversion against killing people for the fun of it. What the fun is, I did not quite understand at the time. In the meanwhile, the ample exploration of revolutionary consciousness have cast some light on this matter. The fun consists in gaining a pseudo-identity through asserting one's power, optimally by killing somebody, a pseudo-identity as a substitute for the human self that has been lost. Some of these problems I have touched upon on occasion in my study on the eclipse of reality. A good example of the type of self that has to kill other people in order to regain what it has lost in an ersatz form is the famous Saint Just who says that Brutus either has to kill other people or kill himself. The matter has been explored by Camus and the murderous equanimity of the intellectuals who have lost their self and want to regain it by becoming the pimps for this or that murderous totalitarian power is excellently exemplified by Maurice Merleau-Ponty's Humanism et Terreur, 1947. I have no sympathy whatsoever for this type of mind and never have hesitated to characterize it as murder swine. The third motive that I can ascertain in my hatred against ideologies is that of a man who likes to keep his language clean. If anything is characteristic for ideologies and ideological thinkers, it is the distraction of language sometimes on the level of intellectual jargon, on a high level of, of complication, sometimes on, the, on a very vulgarian level. From my personal experiences with various ideologies of an Hegelian or Marxist type, I have the impression that a good number of men of considerable intellectual energy, who otherwise would be Marxists, prefer to be Hegelians because Hegel is so much more complicated. It is a difference, not of any profound conviction, but I would compare it to a difference between a man who prefers chess to playing pinochle. Hegel is more complicated, and one can easily spend a lifetime in exploring possibilities of interpreting reality from this or that corner of the Hegelian system.
without of course ever touching on the premises which are wrong and perhaps without ever finding out that there are premises which are wrong.